Ships Educational Series. Today we have Captain Tal Manville, who led the team that designed the USS Gerald Ford, the largest warship in the history of Navy and the largest aircraft carrier. Captain Manville, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Glad to be seen. Oh, no. My pleasure. So let's jump right into it. In the age of knowledge, where everything is known, aren't aircraft carriers really sitting ducks? No, they're not sitting ducks. They are 100,000 tons of uh, moving steel with uh, all sorts of uh, compartmentation that resists damage, um, side protection system to protect against uh, torpedo attack, and they can move uh, and change their position uh, some 600 miles in 24 hours. Well, you mentioned torpedo. How many torpedoes would be needed to take the four, uh, the four down? I mean, one, two, three? Um, typically, we design it for a uh, single digit number of torpedo hits. Okay. Okay. That's, that's about as close as I can uh, describe it without saying the classified number. Do but they, it's more than one. Do they use watertight doors like we're familiar with from Titanic? Uh, Titanic didn't have watertight doors. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Oh, yes, very much so. One of the things about the Titanic, though, is that they actually there was a part where the water could flow over some of the uh, longitudinal bulkheads. It wasn't completely watertight. And yeah. in fact, one of the, uh, one of the big uh, lessons learned from the Titanic is that no berthing compartments in the U.S. Navy are put below the waterline on ships. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't know, I didn't know that. Yeah, the Titanic was an awfully, uh, just one of the, the dumbest things that's, that's ever happened, I think, in the history of uh, you know, maritime uh, disasters. But yeah. with all the conflict in the South China Sea, was the ship designed to be able to navigate those waters specifically? Well, uh, yes. I mean, uh, yes. It, can, it has no problems navigating around the South China Sea. Uh, now, the Chinese have basically armed a bunch of uh, islands and have built them up to make them uh, uh, military bases, but, uh, but we have no problems going through there. And in fact, one of the things that uh, you, you and your uh, students can do is go to the, Na to the Navy website, navy.mil, and you'll see like for the last uh, two weeks, we had two aircraft carriers that was uh, sailing around in the South China Sea. Um, being, uh, you know, just just showing that we can exercise the freedom of sea there. Something I think that the Chinese don't want to have happen. So, um, no. but had, but uh, because of the uh, pandemic and uh, other bad news, uh, those uh, those maneuvers haven't been well publicized here in the United States. But what about the catapult system? Uh, I know that there were some issues with, uh, you know, uh, launching. Uh, the launching system. Have those been resolved fully? I think they've gotten through most of them. They, they've gotten through the, uh, uh, they had some kinks that uh, required that they couldn't fly airplanes the last time they went to sea for a couple of days, but they got that fixed. But the, uh, the vendor for it, General Atomics, has had, a, has had his problems of bringing that along, but it has now worked. It's, I think it's, uh, it's launched uh, without incident over 800 or 900 uh, uh, launches, and the resting gear has also worked well. So if it were two in the morning and the ship were under attack, how quickly could the 75 planes be put into the air? Well, it all depends upon uh, the alert status. You could put uh, two catapults or two airplanes on uh, two catapults for a uh, five minute alert where they're sitting in the cockpit ready to go or you can go to a 15 or 30 minute alert, depending upon the threat um, and how well, how well we could uh, be warned of, of a threat coming. We spent, uh, when I was, uh, I was a second engineer on the Midway, which was home ported out of Japan, we would go up off, the, of, off of the Kamchatka Peninsula and uh, more or less provoke the Russians to come out, to come out and play with us. And one of the things that we had to do was to launch our aircraft uh, quick enough to get out to 200 miles from the ship, which was beyond the, uh, 
weapons range of the Russian uh, backfire bombers and just to kind of engage them there. And so we did that um, a lot. And in fact, um, there was an exercise that, that later got declassified called Able Archer that, you're, uh, that you can Google, where basically uh, the uh, Russian double agent uh, called up the British and said, tell the Americans to back off a little bit, will you please? <laughs> because they thought we were, uh, they thought Ronald Reagan really wanted to, uh, to attack them. And so we had to back off and, uh, and not do the mischief that our airplanes were doing up there. And, uh, and it kind of worked. I think it, it basically did what um, Sun Tzu would call is exercising supreme excellence. To fight and win in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists of breaking your enemy's resistance without fighting. Yes, I agree. Yeah, the art of war is a fantastic read. I really enjoy that. Uh, yeah. I definitely recommend that to any of my students. So, speaking of out and doing mischief, how long can it do it for? Yeah, I saw twenty-five years, but could it stay out for longer? Well, the uh, fuel can last uh, twenty-five to thirty years, depending upon the op tempo. Um, in in uh, when the USS Enterprise CVN 65 was first, uh, was first built. It went around the world in uh, Operation uh, Earth Orbit in 65 days with two uh, nuclear escorts. It did not need any, um, any replenishment for food. They were able to feed the crews of both escorts and the Enterprise of 5,000 for 65 days without uh, unwrapping. They did unwrap one day when, the, um, when they were going by Australia and Australia wanted to give us a kangaroo. Oh, really? <laughs> and so, uh, but, but for the most part, they were able to circumnavigate the, the world in uh, 65 days. And, uh, and there was enough fuel now that's been put into the Ford that it can easily go around the world more than, more than 50 times. Oh, wow more than 50 times, but for, uh, but in terms of uh, food, 90 days is the okay. amount of food that we have on board for the crew. Yeah, no, that's the realistic, uh, the realistic number, of course. No, um, so I've got to ask about the, the rail gun. I know that's an experimental, are you able to talk about that or is that? Well, possible? emails is, a, a, emails is a form of linear motor technology. The railgun is uh, is basically shooting basically a big piece of steel uh, that can go pretty damn far. And uh, I have uh, consulted with the Rand Corporation on a study, oh maybe 15 years ago, to uh, first see how that was coming. Uh, that's coming, uh, but uh, I really don't know much about it other than the fact that it uses uh, linear inductive motors to accelerate a big chunk of steel. And it supposedly can, you know, be ranges of a uh, hundred miles or more. So, if the aircraft carrier is attacked, it will use missiles to defend itself. Uh, ideally, if it doesn't have time to launch its planes. Well, the railguns, uh, the 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 catapult system is not a railgun. It does okay. not shoot. Well, the catapult systems for the the planes, of course. Right, right. right. So we don't have a railgun on the aircraft carrier. Okay, that's correct. So, so we do have. But we do have three sets of, uh, of uh, self-defense missile systems that are based upon the NATO Sea Sparrow that are called. There's an expanded range NATO Sea Sparrow that's a little bit longer. Uh, the Sea Sparrow was a air-to-air -air missile that was converted to be a surface-to-air missile. And then they, ex they, they call in an ev evolves Sea Sparrow that's a little bit longer, it's mid-range. And then we have a rolling frame missile called the RAM that's also integrated with the uh, Gatling gun, the SeaWiz Gatling gun that has a magazine of uh, armored piercing rounds, 1500 that can last, um, well, 1500 and it can shoot at 4,500 rounds a minute, but it only carries 1500. But it's also integrated with this RAM missile, so it's, that's in for close close defense against uh, missile attack, cruise missiles, and also ballistic missiles. Now, really? whether or not we can handle the DF-21, that's a, 
that's an interesting problem. We have, uh, but we have operated all during the time of the Soviet Union. Uh, we have operated underneath the threat of of, uh, of ballistic uh, missile attack. So, so, let's say in ten years we're not even using pilots for our fighter jets. Will the Ford be able to launch uh, planes without human pilots? Yes, yes. In fact, yes, it can. And uh, we design the, uh, the the Ford was designed to take autonomous aircraft. But it isn't going to come that quick. Really? When do you expect autonomous aircraft to come? Um, I expect in about completely. Well, I expect that we're going to have what they call the Stingray. That's a that's a um, a uh, stealthy looking um, uh, Boeing aircraft that will be used for refueling. That should be in the fleet in a couple of years. Okay. Okay. And one of the things you want to do with unmanned aircraft, you want a big deck because uh, you want to be able to maneuver that with people that are doing, you know, the joystick stuff on the flight deck with the airplane. And uh, they need to work that out. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time for them to figure that out to also work with the manned aircraft because they, if you've ever seen the flight deck operations, they get very close to the edge of the deck and, they're, and, they, and they trust those handlers that are giving those, the waves to them with those uh, flashlights. And it's going to take a little bit of time, but I do think that we are in the last era of manned aircraft. So, but I think they'll be around for 20, maybe 30 years, max. Yeah, I would obviously agree with that from all of the research I've done, but you're, you're the expert. I, I'm just, uh, well, I'm not so much an expert on aircraft, but I, but I do know that, uh, I'm a little bit disappointed that the X-47B wasn't further used as an experiment. It landed on uh, one of the Nimitz class carriers and it was kind of like a prototype that proved it could land and launch. And so that wasn't a problem. Um, where, also the, where also the new uh, electromagnetic arresting gear, which basically has a electric motor that can be fine tuned along with a basically like a bathtub paddle water um, break by having that electrical being able to tune it electrically where you can slow it down that we could land much lighter aircraft than what we land now the the aircraft uh, arresting systems its inertia is based upon high performance heavy fast aircraft that have to land at at a speed of you know like 125 knots. So if we ha have planes powered by uh, electric motors, that would be much lighter than current jet engines. Well, it's 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 not only it's it's not only the, the jet engines. It's the it's the resting gear that was a hydraulic system that basically had a tube that was wrapped around cables that that basically pushed uh, a fluid through an orifice that basically then determined how much. But that that whole system had a large amount of weight to stop the high performance aircraft that we fly now. One of the promises of the being able to, uh, to control them is to do it with lighter airplanes. So we could put a whole bunch of drones on board and, you know, and be able to uh, provide a swarming launch of unmanned aircraft. But I think that's 20, 30 years away. Okay. And so, does any other country have anything like this? How, how, do you how do you compare China's aircraft carriers towards what we have? Well, what they have are Stovall aircraft right now because they, are, they basically are short takeoff, vertical landing, and uh, they are, um, and they don't have large magazines. And so, and they don't have a lot of the aircraft and they're walking their way through this. It took us, you know, a hundred years of, of playing around with airplanes to where we can safely do it as we do now. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the, the safety record has come down from, that used to be after World War II, we were killing one out of every three test pilots in advanced test pilot school. Wow. You know, it was it was just incredible, and they started coming down. They were saying this can't you know this can't stand, and they have they brought down the rate down you know almost to like single digit, uh, what they call class one accidents from when it used to be in the five hundreds. 
come from uh, Cheadle. It's great to hear that it's gotten safer. You know, uh, I, I read the right stuff, and I remember thinking, God, you know, this is the most dangerous occupation ever. Who would ever want to do this? But, um, you know, with automated uh, planes, hopefully, well, sooner than later, you know, human life can be spared significantly. So, you know, we can feel confident that uh, the U.S. military is decades ahead of anyone else, or is Russia close? No, Russia isn't close. Um, they, uh, no, they're not close. And, and, and China is now uh, building its first, what's called uh, conventional takeoff and landing aircraft, like we have with the catapults and arresting gear. They're in the process of making that change uh, right now. They're building the third aircraft carrier. And whether or not that's nuclear powered or gas turbine, um, I don't know yet. I bet it will be nuclear powered because I think the Chinese uh, want to do that. They want to strut their technology out there. Yeah. Um, but it's going to take them a long while. They're going to they're going to kill a lot of, a lot of pilots before they really get good. So, but uh, based upon what's going on in Hong Kong, um, it it may go down pretty soon, a lot sooner than we think. So. We'll see. We will see. Well, uh, this was awesome having you on. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, you know, before I, uh, I I let you go, I, I'd love to ask: Do you have any parting words for you know where you see uh, the U.S. military versus the rest of the world? Well, I think we have um, neglected the military in terms of uh, having it get uh, much smaller than it needs to be. If and if um, and I and I worry about the uh, uh, the Chinese and also with Putin uh, exerting more you know more dictatorship type of uh, you know leadership around the world. So um, I think we're going to get challenged here in in uh, in the near future in our time, and I think particularly with China. So um, they want to change the paradigm of the use of the oceans from the Western to the uh, Chinese paradigm where they're in charge, not us. Well, also speaking of paradigms, will we need battleships in the future or are battleships an obsolete item? They're obsolete. Okay. They're obsolete. Uh, the Marines uh, have designed uh, good amphibious ships where they can use those, uh, those, uh, B-22s to maneuver where they don't have to land where they're expected to be landed. They can, they can do a real end sweep and put, and put their troops down where they are not in harm's way as much as in the old days where you just had to do a, an opposed landing against a, a heavily fortified beach. Those days are over. And the Marines uh, use maneuver warfare and have, and have created the aircraft that they need to do that. So I don't, uh, um, and I hope that we continue to maintain our amphibious uh, assault capability because I think some of the conflicts like in the uh, large Muslim country of Indonesia may, uh, that's where that may be needed because of the uh, large, uh, you know, the Indian, or the Indonesian uh, ar archipelagos. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was a, uh... Uh, very interesting, very educational conversation, and Captain Manville.